Hey everybody, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. Today we're going to be continuing the Pong series. Um, in the last video, if you haven't checked that out, you should. We created a window and this is sort of what we left off with. If we run this code, we can pull this window over here and we just get a window that says Pong. <clears throat> in today's, series, uh, today's video, we're going to be uh, setting up a game loop. So this will control the frames per second and we'll see how we can uh, print out what frames per second we're running at and if we want to cap that and stuff. And then at the end of the video, we'll also go over some simple methods to paint the window, um, just so that you know how to repaint that and how we're going to go through that. So what we're going to start off with is what we want our window to do. So typically in a game engine, you would have a update loop. So we will say public void update double delta time or DT. And so this is what we would ideally want to happen. And when we say print the delta time, that should give us the time that it took to complete the last frame. And so right now what's happening is this is the loop that is being run by our thread. And so what we want to do is we want to call update every frame of our game, and then we want to pass in how long it took to do the last frame. So for that, we're going to make a quick class that's going to help us with the time. We'll just call this time. And I don't want to open that in a new window. So open that up. Okay, and so basically all time is going to be in charge of is calling Java's uh, system.getNanoTime. So get the best time measurement that we can on the operating system you're running on. So first we're going to have a static variable called time started. This will be the time that the game engine started. And so we will just say this is system.NanoTime. And all this does is return the system's current time in nanoseconds. So and then we'll have a static method called get time and this will just return the system.nanotime minus the time started so this will give us the time that our game engine's been running since the game engine has started and then i'm going to say times 1 e to the minus 9 cuz what this is actually going to give us is it's going to give us um and then we want to What's up with this? Oh, semicolon. There we go. Not semicolon there. Okay, and so the reason we want to multiply by one, one times ten to the minus nine is because system dot nano time uh, actually returns it in an integer value, and so it returns the number of nanoseconds in like so it'll be like thousands upon thousands of nanoseconds, and so we just want to convert that to seconds, which will make it easier for us when we go to uh, actually determine how much time has passed. Okay. Okay, and then so we'll go back to our window class and then inside of here we can say um, double last frame time equals 0.0. .0. So we'll use this to determine how much time has passed in between the frames. And then we'll say um, time equals time dot get time. And then we will say delta time equals time minus the last frame time. And so this will give us a weird value for the first and what's going on here? last frame time oh missed an either so this will give us a weird value for the very first frame because this will be initialized to zero and then uh, this is going to be some value it'll be pretty close but it won't be spot on but um second frame on it should be pretty accurate to how much time actually passed between the frames and so then we can say last frame time equals time and this is so that when we go to get the next uh, time this will be accurate up to how much time has actually elapsed since we rendered the last frame. Then we can just say update delta time. And that will call our update loop. And we should get printed out here um, how much time has passed between the frames. And then I'm just gonna add some formatting. So we'll do a string to cast that to a string. And we'll say seconds passed since the last frame. <clears throat> okay, so we can look in here and then we see when we press shift F10 and for some reason we're not getting anything. So what's wrong with this? Turns out when we started our thread, we forgot to pass it the class that we want to start it on. So if we just say thread T1 equals new thread window, this will actually start the thread in this class before we were just starting a thread that did absolutely nothing. Okay, so then if we just run that again, shift F10, and if we look down here, we get how much time in seconds has passed since the last frame. 
So we have the frames per second, or the seconds passed since the last frame, and then if we want to convert that to frames per second, we can simply say system.out.println, and then we'll say one over delta time, because we've had one frame pass in that amount of time, and then we can say FPS. And depending on your system, uh, your frames per second are gonna say something very high. So if we hit Shift F10, then we can look over here. And like mine is saying 227,000. And you might think that that is outrageous. So just to double check and make sure that this is all working right, we can say try uh, thread.sleep 30. So we'll sleep 30 milliseconds. And then and we have to wrap it in this try catch because that the thread.sleep may throw an exception. And we'll do nothing if there's an exception thrown. Okay, and so we should get about 30 frames per second with this. So we'll just run this one more time. And if we close this out, we see that we get, oh, we deleted that too. Here, let's write that back in real quick. So we'll say one over DT plus FPS. Okay, there we go. And then we can see that it is running at 33 frames per second. Okay, so that is all working correctly and your numbers will vary depending on your system. But if you do this little thread dot sleep, you should get around 30 frames per second. If you want to leave the frame rate uncapped, just leave that out and we will handle all the movement and everything by using delta time to make sure that it all gets uh, rendered at a consistent rate across systems. Okay. So I promised that we would also do some simple painting of the screen. So in order to do that, we need this handle on our window called graphics 2D and we'll call this G2. And so whenever we create this one, and then we're, get, we're also gonna have to import this. So if we look over here, uh, it tells us Java uh, graphics 2D. So we'll import Java dot, dot graphics 2D. And then in our initialization, we can say G2 equals, and we're gonna cast this to graphics 2d um, this dot get graphics uh, get graphics usually just returns a simple graphics object we cast it to graphics 2 2d and then we keep that there okay and then inside the update loop we can say g2 dot set color and then we'll say color dot black to change the color of the screen and then we're also going to have to import color from if we go import java dot dot color okay and then we will color the entire screen this color. So then we can say g2.fill rect. And then we take an x, y, 0, 0. And then we'll take in the width and the height. So that is constants.screen width, constants.screen height. See, this is why we store these in static variables. It makes everything so much more helpful. Okay, and so before we do this, I actually am gonna cap out the frame rate. So we will add this thread.sleep back in because it can overload the system if you just let it run unhandled. So we will do this and then restart this. And then if I bring this over, you can see, and it doesn't look completely right because it started in a different resolution, but your screen should be completely black. And so there we go, we have it filling the rectangle and painting the screen. You can experiment with this. Uh, G2 has a few different uh, methods that you can use. So you can do stuff like fill rect, you can do uh, fill arc. So just experiment with this, try drawing different things, and then you can even try moving things across the screen and everything. So I give that to you as a little homework. Next video, we will start to do uh, some key listener stuff. So we'll add in a key listener so that we can get key input from the user. And then once we get that done, we can move on to actually building the Pong game and having a couple of players and bouncing the ball around. Okay. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.